So you may notice that during this uh, presentation or during this session, there are only two speakers. Um, the reason for that is that the third speaker that we invited, uh, Despina Parvelu in Athens, uh, was not able to attend because she's participating in the uh, international uh, women's strike. Um, and so rather than invite a third speaker, we decided to sort of use that occasion to sort of frame both the women's strike and this conference um, and sort of explore a little bit of what that means, right? Um, so as we return for this afternoon session, I just uh, want to point out, right, like this conference grew out of a reading group, which grew out of the need for some collectivity, some intellectual community in the midst of this like protracted lockdown. Um, and right, the, this acute impossibility of really like leaving the house. Um, so we sort of decided to seize upon that in order to build this space of um, a kind of collective intellectuality. Um, it, and to think with Althusser on these questions of encounter and conjuncture, but also of crisis and their fusion, um, as well as uh, questions of the conditions of the reproduction of capitalism, right? Um, it's also International Women's Day today. Uh, and, you know, there were some questions that we asked ourselves about whether or not that was an infelicitous uh, conjunction. But in as we think about it, like, I think that it's actually, it, it fits together in an interesting way, right? Mm -hmm. Because, among the many forms of appearance, the pandemic uh, presents us with this very acute crisis of social reproduction, right? And those of us who are lucky enough to work from home, uh, we've been become acutely aware of how the private sphere is not is what socialist feminists have always considered have long considered it to be a site of work and work that is often unpaid, undervalued, and feminized. Uh, but which is also a necessary condition of possibility for capitalist accumulation, right? Um, the home, which Leopoldina Fortunati called the arcane of reproduction, is above all the site of the reproduction of this special commodity, labor power. Um, and as over the last year, right, this boundary between home and work has broken down, right? Our Homes have become schools and daycares. They've become spaces for the care of the sick and the elderly and the dying. Um, and the tasks of every, everyday life have become present to us in a way that we might have otherwise been able to avoid. Um, and so uh, and, uh, just to, I don't wanna go on for too long, right? But um, we've also been posed this question of what labor is essential and witness the fragility of supply chains and networks that underlie previously mundane tasks. Uh, we've been exposed to how the most undervalued labor is also the most socially necessary um, with essential workers on the front lines of the pandemic, um, which also are not, inc not incidentally some of the most feminized sectors of our economy, right? Including teachers and nurses and caregivers and hospitals and elder care facilities and elsewhere, right? Um, we've also seen mass unemployment and evictions exposing people who are already vulnerable in our society to homelessness. And even prior to the pandemic, trans women were already facing an epidemic of homelessness. Um, but as Althusser points out to us, right, the capitalist mode of production, of reproduction, is always in crisis. And indeed, crisis is the normal condition of capitalism but we're nonetheless living through what is perhaps the most acute crisis of social reproduction in living memory. Five years ago in 2016, 20, yeah, 2016, uh, feminists around the world began a campaign to repoliticize International Women's Day to recover its original proletarian feminist content, launching a transnational wave of women's strikes. Putting this, the question of social reproduction squarely on the agenda and building a militant feminist front 
uh, cutting against the grain of neoliberal feminism centered principally around the concerns of bourgeois women, leaving the vast majority of women out of the equation. And to the extent that we're able to think this crisis and understand our own conjuncture and begin to articulate modes of struggle that are adequate to this moment, we owe an enormous Have I been muted that whole time? No, that was a misclick, sorry. Was just a moment, okay. <laughs> uh, we owe this uh, debt to, of gratitude to the uh, organizers of the women's strikes around the world because they've put this question on the table, laid the groundwork for us to think it and strategize in it and struggle together to transform these conditions. Um, as readers of Althusser, we also look to this thinker for someone, for resources to grasp our predicament. Um, and among the tasks which we have to take on include exploring the possibilities of uh, that lie dormant in Althusser's work for feminist theory, which um, several of our inter interventions, including Robin's and Natalia's have done um, today. Um, to engage in politics, Althusser remarks, is to act for freedom and equality. And among its many aspects, communism is ultimately founded upon respect, respect for one another. Yet to act as Marxists and militants, we also have to work proactively to organize the possibility of durable encounters through which that fundamental equality can be realized, break down those barriers which help us to sep which keep us separate and prevent us from experimenting with new modes of being together. Um, to quote again, uh, passage that Natalia quoted earlier this morning, right? Uh, the task as ever remains the fight for socialism over barbarism, uh, which Althusser describes in the letter, in the book on imperialism as not signifying simply some regression to a prior state, but rather it names a kind of quote, regression while remaining in place of a kind which human history offers examples by the hundreds. In the midst of the present crisis, we see that our civilization, quote, can perish in place, not only without sinking to a lower stage that has already existed, but in accumulating all the suffering of a childbirth that will not end, of a stillbirth that is not a delivery. And so I just want to thank the, you know, in addition to thanking the organizers, uh, the other organizers and our speakers, all of our contributors, I also want to thank everyone who has helped to give new urgency to the feminist movement today and who've helped us to see this, to see the conditions of this crisis more clearly than we otherwise might've been able to. Uh, and so without further delay, I am very pleased to um, introduce Assad Haider and Robin Marasco. Um, Assad Haider is the author of Mistaken Identity, Race and Class in the Age of Trump, and the founding editor of Viewpoint, Mag uh, founding editor of Viewpoint Magazine, uh, whose numerous interventions and essays have been have both helped, you know, launch uh, the resurgence of interest in Althusser, as well as helped us to think the conditions in the present. Uh, he's also a contributor to Slate N Plus One, The Point, the Baffler, and else and other publications, and co-editor of the forthcoming book. The Black Radical Tradition. Uh, his paper will, is titled, unless it's changed, uh, Althusser or Forgetting. Uh, Robin is a professor of political science at uh, the CUNY Graduate Center, author of The Highway of Despair, Critical Theory After Hegel, and co-editor of The Political Encounter with Louis Althusser with Banu Bargu uh, in a special edition of Rethinking Marxism. She's also the author of numerous articles Alex, you get muted again. Sorry. Am I muting myself? No, I think it's us trying to let people into the the like the the way. To, anyway, sorry. No, that's that's okay. I'm just gonna. Uh, I don't so, like introductions anyway, so it's really fine. <laughs> introductions make me so uncomfortable. So I think oh, it was okay. the gods intervening well, on my behalf. <laughs> 
Um, Robin's the author of numerous articles, uh, which you should check out with two forthcoming articles, uh, including Gender Politics and the State, a Feminist Reading of Wendy Brown, and Thinking at the Extremes, a short essay on Etienne Balibar, um, as well as Althusser's Gramscian Death on Reading Out Loud and Rethinking Marxism, um, and many others. Um, so without further ado, um, Assad, uh, whenever you're ready, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, since there are only two of us, I received uh, permission to go 30 minutes, uh, so I won't delay <clears throat> any further. Uh, but I, I do want to just uh, thank the organizers of this event, which uh, is really uh, outstanding. And I'd like to thank all of you who are attending to see so many people at a conference on Althusser gives one hope for the future of theory. So uh, I have three quotations as, uh, as, as epigraphs. The first is, uh, I forgot it again. I forget everything. I even forget that I forget. That is Althusser letter to Franca Madonia, 1961. The second, the forgetting that thus jumps from one name to another as if to prove the existence of an obstacle which cannot easily be surmounted. That is Freud, Psychopathology of Everyday Life, 1901. Third, never forget the class struggle. That is Mao, 10th plenum of the 8th Central Committee, 1962. So I have previously written about Althusser and politics uh, with attention to his concrete political interventions on the crisis of Marxism and the communist parties in the 1970s. But today I would like to return to the classic texts, the so-called theoreticist texts. And I would like to read Althusser at a theoretical level as a reader of the history of communism. Perhaps the first communist to read these practical works in such a way as to find the discoveries buried under the crushing weight of ideology. In On the Young Marx, we already encounter a protocol for reading the history of communist politics. Asking why Marx expended such an effort in philosophical abstraction, why he worked so meticulously within the existing ideological problematic only in order to exit it, Althusser makes a remarkable reference to the Chinese revolution. What did Marx gain by this theoretical long march that was imposed on him by his own beginning. He goes on to say that Marx's philosophical labors facilitated his acquisition of a clinical sense, which allowed him to detect the struggles between classes and ideologies. But there's more, of course, which is the necessity and contingency of Marx's beginning. While a scientific discovery generates new objects and meanings, the inventor must have formed an intelligence within the old forms, and is thus, Althusser writes, in the paradoxical situation of having to learn the way of saying what he is going to discover in the very way he must forget. I will bring this protocol to the most obvious and yet most exceptional text, Contradiction and Overdetermination, which with its nominalist study of the Russian Revolution can scarcely be viewed as theoreticist, while the reformulation of its themes in On the Materialist Dialectic takes us towards the peak of theoreticism. Yet contradiction and overdetermination is already a theoretical text permeated with citations and readings. And not only of the conjunctural analysis of Lenin, which as Warren Montag has brought to our attention, Althusser once again described as clinical. There are two other figures in the margins of the text that Althusser has decided to read as theorists rather than as political clinicians. We discover the first figure when we look for the source of what Althusser calls the Leninist theme of the weakest link in the imperialist chain. It turns out to be difficult to find this theme in Lenin's work. While Althusser presents this as a concrete analysis pieced together from Lenin's writings in different concrete situations, he also gives us the source in which the metaphor is elaborated as nothing less than a general theory. Indeed, in a chapter called theory of Stalin's foundations of Leninism. But conspicuously absent from this history of knowledge is Stalin's dialectical and historical materialism. This absence is conspicuous because the object of critique in this text is Hegel, rather than any other figure in the communist movement. The Hegelian dialectic, defined as the teleology of the simple contradiction, is even blamed for the twin deviations of economism and technologism. 
which are then attributed to Marx's poverty and poverty of philosophy, though the text is not named, rather than any contemporary expression. Furthermore, Althusser's proposed alternatives to Hegel's dialectic involve two dizzying leaps. The first, obviously, is to Freud, whose account of memory, forgetting, and the clinical practice of working through I do not have the time to address today. But the second is a leap directly over Stalin's head to Mao Zedong. In this brief reference confined to a footnote, Althusser invokes On Contradiction, which Mao wrote in 1937 after the culmination of the actual Long March on the basis of his study of texts of Soviet philosophy, which yielded a series of lectures for the anti-Japanese military and political college on dialectical materialism. Even though On Contradiction precedes the publication of dialectical and historical materialism by a year, it is hard not to see Althusser reading it as a kind of response to Stalin's, Stalin's text, which is suggested by another footnote in On the Materialist Dialectic in which Althusser does finally refer to dialectical and historical materialism, even though the text in question is once again not named. These footnotes are astonishing. Mao presents, Althusser writes, a specifically Marxist conception of contradiction which appears in a quite unhegelian light. Its essential aspects are principal and secondary contradiction, principal and secondary aspect of a contradiction, antagonistic and non-antagonistic contradiction, law of the uneven development of a contradiction. If we compare Althusser's list to Mao's text, we see that he has considerably modified the essential concepts. The first sentence of On Contradiction states that the law of the unity of opposites is the basic law of materialist dialectics. There is a fascinating history of knowledge in the constant revision of the laws of the dialectic, from three laws in Engels, to four laws in Stalin, to one law in Mao. Althusser focuses on one fundamental revision, which becomes apparent in the footnote on Stalin and on the materialist dialectic. This footnote is appended to a complaint about people who collect and disseminate what we are told are the only two Hegelian sentences in the whole of Marx's capital, most importantly, the very metaphorical sentence on the negation of the negation. Althusser writes that while such people reproach Stalin with having suppressed the laws of the dialectic and propose a return to Hegel, it would be simpler to recognize that the expulsion of the negation of the negation from the domain of the Marxist dialectic might be evidence of the real theoretical perspicacity of its author. Now, one would search in vain for a refutation of the negation of the negation by Stalin. Stalin simply omitted it. Mao is more complicated. In lecture notes called Dialectical Materialism, written at the same time as On Contradiction, Mao repeats exactly Engels' three laws, including the negation of the negation. In the original text of On Contradiction, he refers to it in a critique of formal logic, but removes it upon its republication after 1949. Yet he continues to mention it occasionally, even invoking it when he says in 1957, Stalin made mistakes in dialectics. In the speech to the 10th plenum in September 1962, when he advances the momentous slogan, never forget the class struggle, Mao invokes it in a context which will prove to be of considerable importance. Revising his previous conception of the problems of the socialist transition in terms of contradictions among the people, Mao now says that class struggle continues to exist in socialist countries and warns that the remnants of the reactionary classes may attempt a restoration of their rule. If this problem is not confronted, a country like China could still move towards its opposite. But even moving towards the opposite might not matter too much, says Mao, because there would still be the negation of the negation, and they could move towards their opposite again. Remarkably, he adds, if our children's generation go in for revisionism and move towards their opposite, so that although they still nominally have socialism, it is in fact capitalism, then our grandsons will certainly rise up in revolt and overthrow their fathers because the masses will not be satisfied. Exactly one year after the publication of Althusser's On the Materialist Dialectic, Mao addresses the same questions in his talk on questions of philosophy. Claudia Pozzana suggests that we can conceive of a group within the Translation Bureau of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party, assigned to translating La Pensée, the philosophical journal of the French Communist Party where both contradiction and overdetermination 
and on the materialist dialectic were originally published. Since these texts discuss Mao, she speculates, it is possible that a summary, if not a complete translation, came at some point to Mao's attention. We must admit that the evidence for this fascinating possibility is at best circumstantial. Nevertheless, the juxtaposition is striking. Noting that Engels had three laws of the dialectic, Mao declares, as for me, I don't believe in two of those categories. The most basic thing is the unity of opposites. The transformation of quantity into quality is just the unity of the opposites quantity and quality. And there is no such thing as the negation of the negation. There's only affirmation, negation, affirmation, negation, and every link in the chain of events is both affirmation and negation. Accordingly, Mao says he accepts any kind of rebellion against the socialist state. He says, let them attack us madly, demonstrate in the streets, take up arms to rebel. I approve all of these things. Society is very complex. There is not a single commune, a single department of the central committee in which one cannot divide into two. He adds, I don't believe that communism will not be divided into stages. Lenin said that all things can be divided. This vision of the future builds to an extraordinary statement, which comes two months after the publication of Althusser's Marxism and Humanism, and two years before Foucault would announce the death of man. Mao says, the life of dialectics is the continuous movement toward opposites. Mankind will also finally meet its doom. When the theologians talk about doomsday, they are pessimistic and terrify people. We say the end of mankind is something which will produce something more advanced than mankind. While we cannot simply conflate this statement with theoretical anti-humanism, it takes up themes that were already part of political discourse, as in the 1963 polemic of the Chinese Communist Party, which charged that by speaking of a state of the whole people, the Soviet Union had substituted humanism for the Marxist-Leninist theory of class struggle. It is this idea of the state of the whole people which frames Althusser's critique in Marxism and humanism. As we all know, Althusser defines humanism as the ideology which says that history is the alienation and production of the true man in the alienated man, and that it is impossible to know anything about men until the philosophical myth of man is reduced to ashes. But this theoretical question has highly practical stakes because humanist ideology has displaced the investigation of the forms of economic, political, and cultural organization, which are necessary to achieve the transition to communism, the end of the dictatorship of the proletariat, and the withering away of the state apparatus. Mao's discourse on the end of mankind is also situated within a theory of transition, of the transition to communism, which is not the end of history. Mao does not present a theory of knowledge, but another theory of history, History not as the realization of man, but as the movement of contradictions which never cease. We might ask whether this theory of history remains an altered teleology by, envis by envisioning something more advanced. However, since the negation of the negation is no longer available to us, it becomes difficult to picture this historical trajectory. What comes after mankind that is more advanced than mankind? Not a more advanced mankind, which would be the comfort provided by the negation of the negation, but something other than mankind. Is the end of mankind communism, a condition for communism, its result? Nothing suggests that there is an answer to this question. The end of mankind is simply one outcome of the perpetual unity and struggle of opposites. There is no meaning or direction to the historical process, no subject or goal, because there will continue to be contradictions and there will be stages of history not because they will progress towards the highest and final stage, but simply because all things can be divided. Does Mao nonetheless present us with an eschatology latent in any apocalyptic vision? Note that he is at pains to distinguish this vision from that of the theologians, whose pessimism terrifies people. Yet soon enough, a distinct pessimism emerges in Mao's thought, which he calls the probable defeat the prediction that the restoration of capitalism is the most likely possibility. We appear to be dealing with a far more ordinary, mundane category than the end of mankind, yet it is now that there appears to be a direction to history, but a bad direction. Between the end of mankind and the probable defeat is the cultural revolution. <laughs>
I will make one exception to my theoreticist constraint by looking at Althusser's 1967 commentary in which he says that the cultural revolution presents an intense theoretical interest since it addresses the conceptual problems of development which are operative in the conjuncture of every socialist country. In a socialist country, a political revolution has taken place which means the seizure of state power leading to the dictatorship of the proletariat. It is followed by an economic revolution, which means the socialization of the means of production. But after the political and economic revolutions, there is the risk of regression back to capitalism. According to Althusser, cultural revolution demonstrates that to prevent regression, the political and economic revolutions must be followed by a mass ideological revolution which replaces bourgeois ideology with a new proletarian and socialist ideology and gives the socialist base and political superstructure a corresponding ideological superstructure. This notion that different levels must be brought into correspondence poses some problems. The fact that they do not already correspond indicates a decalage which characterizes historical time but with a general and predetermined succession of revolutions from level to level and the goal of their correspondence, we appear to be operating according to a linear time since it is unclear how to measure this correspondence unless the temporality of one level functions as the reference or each level is measured against an unspecified reference time. Note that the term overdetermination does not appear in this article but we do find the phrase determination in the last instance by the economic. The moment which, of course, contradiction and overdetermination tells us never arrives. As I have read contradiction and, and overdetermination over and over since I first discovered Althusser's work, and it was the first of his texts that I read, and as I have tried to untangle it with new readers, I have become increasingly convinced that the phrase determination in the last instance is conceptually vacuous its content already ruthlessly destroyed by the concept of overdetermination and immediately undermined by the beautiful and mystifying formulation of the lonely hour which never comes. But now this evocative paradox of contradiction and overdetermination disappears and the temporal language shifts to the architectural language of levels. But the metaphor becomes complicated. Althusser says ideology is cement rather than a floor which seeps into every room. This image is used to advance the idea that ideology is made up of objective social relations, but poses new problems. How can cement be a level? And how can the primacy of the level of cement follow in chronological succession the primacy of the two other levels it has already seeped into? Needless to say, one would not want to spend much time in this building. Such equivocations are symptomatic and the theory of ideology itself is a symptom, filling in the empty space left by an unformulated question. Althusser says that ideological revolution can only be made by the masses themselves through mass organizations. And what is original and innovative about the cultural revolution is the emergence of organizations distinct from other organizations of the class struggle, the union and party. However, Althusser immediately qualifies this by saying that the cultural revolution is carried out under the leadership of the communist party, which links these new organizations to the old ones. Not only is the proposition of mass self-organization canceled by the assertion of the leadership of the party, it is reduced to the level of ideology. The mass form of this new type of organization becomes the expression of the level. But rather than a question of which form corresponds to which level, this is actually a question about communist politics, which disturbs the whole existing revolutionary problematic, whether there can be political organizations which are not the party. As if to neutralize this question, Althusser converts it into the question of correspondence between forms and levels and asserts the primacy of the party. But at the same time, he quite clearly shows why this question is disturbing, because he has to explain why it is that this new type of organization emerged. He writes that after the first revolutionary seizure of power, the party must assume leadership of the state, state power, and the state apparatus, and consequently 
a partial but inevitable fusion will occur between the party and the state apparatus. The Cultural Revolution proposes that the new type of organization must be distinct from the party in order to force it to distinguish itself from the state. How do we understand these equivocations? Althusser gives a hint in his elaboration of the character of the ideological struggle, noting that there is an ideological void, which without the self-education and transformation of mass organizations will be filled in with bourgeois ideology. In the presentation of symptomatic reading, reading capital described places of the void in a text, the places where the text simultaneously points outside of itself to a real but absent question and within itself to the absence of a concept behind a word. In this analysis, the language of ideology itself constitutes the ideological plenitude that obscures the absence of concepts. Rosana Rosanda sharply perceived this problem in her article on the Cultural Revolution, which rejected its characterization as an ideological struggle. In a previous discussion of these texts, I too quickly attempted to reconcile them by pointing out that Rosanda retained a view of ideology as consciousness, while Althusser understood ideology as material and objective conditions. And so they were ultimately saying the same thing. This argument, while accurate regarding the theory of ideology, nevertheless missed the more radical implications of Rosanda's argument regarding the political and economic levels. The view that the socialist transition is characterized by the superstructure lagging behind the base appears to be consistent with Althusser's critique of linear historical time. But Rosanda points out that this was simply the orthodox interpretation of the communist movement since the 20th Congress. The lag is not constitutive as it was in contradiction and overdetermination. It now becomes an error which must be corrected by making the superstructure correspond to the base. Rosanda argues that the cultural revolution is in fact a revolution of the economic base, aiming at changes in economic relations that went beyond property ownership, which could only be carried out by putting politics in command, meaning a form of mass agency that went beyond the seizure of power. Now, there are no avoiding a distressing realization. This political problem of the independence of mass organizations from the party state cannot be explained with the category of class struggle. Throughout the cultural revolution, the working class was internally divided and class categories did not line up with political positions. The identity of the working class with the party and the party with the state were exactly what independent mass organization threw into question and egalitarian political invention could not be conceived as the expression of a class foundation. Class struggle is a symptom in Althusser's text, just as, as it is in Mao's constantly repeated injunction to never forget the class struggle. To return to Althusser in On the Young Marx, what is at stake in the Cultural Revolution is precisely the articulation of the new within the old forms, the proposition of inventing a communist politics outside and beyond the party state, which nevertheless remained within its limits. And what we see in Althusser's text is the working through within the old language of the limits of state socialism and the capacity of Marxist theory to understand it and make political propositions about it. In his study of the Cultural Revolution, Alessandro Russo invokes the necessity of symptomatic reading to interpret the persistence of old languages and forms within a new political conjuncture for which they were no longer operative. Terms like class struggle and seizure of power marked absences which corresponded to concepts that were necessary for the new, new theoretical formulation, but still beyond the available discursive resources. They ended up being filled with substitute concepts, which came from the old problematic and functioned retroactively to bring political innovations back within the conceptual framework they had initially exceeded. Reading capital established that it was only by reading Marx the way he read that his inventions could be observed. But it is already in On the Young Marx that we are presented with Marx's discovery of history as a retreat to reality, a formulation which will lead Althusser to qualify the essay's publication in For Marx with the acknowledgement that it remains trapped in the myth of an evanescent critical philosophy. 
But this retreat from ideology to reality was also the discovery of a radically new reality, which could be found nowhere in philosophy. It was the discovery of the class struggle, of flesh and blood capitalism, and of the organized proletariat. I will not now suggest in my own myth of evanescence that in the retreat to reality, we discover the flesh and blood of the class struggle as the unity of history and politics, but rather that for Althusser, class struggle appears as a symptom invoked to solve an absent question in the places where his theoretical work appears to preclude the possibility of resistance and therefore of politics and thus perhaps of communism. But it is Althusser too, who had to learn to say what he was going to discover in the way he had to forget. What he had to say about communist politics, he had to say within the language of Marxism and the historical world, which for every communist was defined by the successes and failures of the great revolutions. And in which what was politically novel, what we could know or say about politics in the empty conceptual space opened up by the transition had to be stated in the very language that obscured its novelty. Perhaps when we read the history of communism, our task is to learn how to forget it, to break through the layer of ideology that history has deposited over us in order to be able to think it, to think communism in its emergence in the present, to invent communism for a future which may otherwise not last a long time. Thank you very much um, for the excellent paper. Um, so we will hold questions until the end, but if, is that okay with, with you both? Um, so that we can have a little bit of crosstalk between both of you. Um, but um, if you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Otherwise we'll address that later. Um, without further ado, um, Robin Morasco. Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks to all. Um, I'm not entirely confident about my internet connection here. Um, so let's just, uh, you know, see what's in store for us. I wanted to um, thank especially the Althusser Reading Group who organized this event and Alex, Brendan and Justin for inviting me. I am um, beyond honored to be on this program. Um, I'm very aware that I'm playing a bit out of my league here too. Um, the others who are here are um, those who taught me how to read Althusser and taught me uh, what's at stake in reading him politically. Um, special thanks I think are due to my co-panelist Assad who now gives me the unenviable task of speaking after him. Um, and uh, I probably don't need to say it here, but um, Assad is, uh, is inspiration and a treasure as a writer and as a thinker and a translator and an editor, um, but also as an organizer and as a teacher of political ideas. And for me, he has been an intellectual lifeline in this pandemic um, and my own thinking about Althusser, especially in the past year has been uh, significantly shaped um, by conversations with him. And I also want to acknowledge Duncan and Brian and Taylor and now Dave, um, who've been a part of these um, discussions. I have the sense that we are in the midst of an Althusser revival of which uh, this conference uh, is demonstration. What, did it, what is it a sign of? It seems appropriate that I begin with Althusser's own words. It is a sign, as Lenin used to put it, that revolution is on the agenda. This does not mean the nuance is crucial, that the situation is revolutionary. We are still a long way from that. So um, we're uh, gathered here virtually on International Women's Day, um, whose motto for this year is choose to challenge, which you will forgive me, I think, risks making a virtue of necessity. Today is also the day of women's global, the women's global strike when women around the world are collectively withdrawing from both formal work and from the care and domestic work that they uh, perform at home. Uh, the organizers of the global strike have advised that where, is, where protest, where it's not possible to withdraw from work uh, completely uh, to slow down as a form of 
uh, protest. So perhaps the weaknesses or errors uh, in my remarks can be forgiven and chalked up to uh, slowing down as an exhausted protest against our current labor conditions. My household consists of one other adult who works 14 hours a day at UPS, making sure the packages get delivered, and one seven-year-old who is upstairs doing her schoolwork. Uh, and I am here, uh, I hope not actually strike-breaking with all of you uh, to talk about Alcacerin feminism. Okay, so what every child knows, most of you will immediately recognize the reference for my title. It comes from the famous uh, notes on ideology and ideological state apparatus. The line um, I think is actually quite hilarious and it's uh, sort of one of the many hilarious lines in the pages uh, of, of Althusser uh, where Althusser says, every child knows that a social formation which did not reproduce the conditions of production at the same time as it produced would not last a year. So I'm, I'm not sure that every child knows that. I think it's sort of hilarious uh, to begin uh, uh, a kind of a, a reconstruction of the idea of reproduction in that way. I'm not sure that every child understands the concept of social reproduction, but I am compelled by the claim that the process by which the child comes to know something as obvious is the starting point for the theory of ideology. And nothing is more obvious to the child than the authority of the family, even or especially for the child who doesn't have one, uh, a topic of considerable importance to Althusser, uh, by the way. The other part of my title, Althusser and Feminism, we might well, uh, it, it, it might be, I think, obvious that Althusser represents um, a, a kind of challenge uh, for feminism, um, and in turn, that feminism poses a challenge to the intellectual uh, postures and positions that I think all too hard, all, all too often harden in defense uh, and deference to Althusser. Um, I don't intend for us to be uh, derailed today by the question of how to read politically someone who strangled and killed his wife but I admit that I have not found a wholly satisfactory resolution to it myself. I don't think it can be passed over in silence though, unless by our silence, we're saying something profound about the construction of traditions and the protection barrier that forms against those questions that are too difficult to ask, too disturbing to our theoretical positions and political concepts especially disturbing when we consider that strangulation is the most deadly form of domestic violence, that its signs are often harder to see, that according to one study published in 2008 in the Journal of Emergency Medicine, attempted strangulation is by far the leading predictor of future deadly violence in the home. The revolutionary struggles occurring in all parts of the world from Argentina to Mexico to the United States, Turkey and Poland which Natalie Rome spoke so beautifully in reference to in the first panel, are movements formed in protest and struggle against gendered and gendering violence. I'm aware that this tragic case is complicated by Althusser's lifelong struggle with mental illness and the post-traumatic stress from being held as a prisoner of war by the Germans. I'm also aware that this tragedy has been used by his opponents to discredit the, his thought and the Marxist tradition and communist tradition of which he is an essential part. And this is not my intention at all. Uh, but I would be remiss if it went unmentioned today of all days and in the context of a set of reflections on Althusser and feminism. One thing I appreciate about Butler's Althusser, whatever the limits of her largely Hegelian reading of, interpretation, of interpolation, is that she treats the scene of Althusser rushing out of his home and into the street to hail a police officer ha after having accidentally strangled his wife as an entryway, an entry point into his thought, right? For Butler, it is here in this scene where Hegelian recognition and Nietzschean conscience as she understands them come together in what Butler sees as a kind of reverse interpolation, 
whereby the subject formed through guilt calls out to the police in a cry of conscience. I appreciate Butler's reading because I think she does not force us to remain silent about the killing, but speaks of it not to condemn Althusser again, but to make sense of his concepts and the powers that he sought to identify. She proposes that by speaking of Althusser's crime, we might learn something more clearly in his thought. And for her, it will bring certain elements to the fore, language, law, the subject. Indeed, these are the three categories around which Butler's engagement, very much a feminist engagement with Althusser revolve, language, law, and the subject. Butler's work represents, I think, one powerful and very influential strain of Althusserian feminism. If I will put it uh, too simplistically, and you'll forgive me, I will say that it's the strand of Althusserian feminism that finds in a theory of ideology primarily a theory of the subject, a theory of subject production and its requirement. Today here I'm in, I'm sketching uh, the pursuit of a, a slightly different approach. One that I see not quite as contrary to Butler's, although I am happy to talk in more detail in Q and A about what I think she gets right and what I think she gets wrong in Althusser and more broadly what I think are the costs of extracting the theory of interpolation from the larger Marxist project of which it is a part. But I'm in, interested in a different aspect of the theory of ideology, not a theory of the subject, but a concept of the state. The elements of an Althusserian theory of the state and its correspondence. Hold on just one second, I'm so sorry. I think we're good, <laughs> alas. Um, I'm interested uh, in a concept of the state in an Althusserian theory of the state and its uh, correspondence or non-correspondence uh, with the mostly abandoned effort to develop a feminist theory of the state. An effort that I associate with names like Catherine McKinnon, Hortense Spillers, and even the early work of Wendy Brown. I will leave aside what I see as another strand of Althusserian feminism, the Spinozist strand that draws from Althusser in pursuit of a feminist metaphysics or conversely, a feminist critique of metaphysics. Uh, I am not a philosopher. I'm in no position to weigh in on uh, some of the questions raised in these uh, and by these fascinating uh, debates. Mm -hmm. Uh, I am a political theorist and perhaps even a political scientist uh, and largely suspicious of Marxism's tendency to slide into metaphysics, a suspicion I believe I share with Althusser at least in some of his moments. What I will say is I hope that feminist metaphysics, uh, which I think sometimes goes by the maddening name of new materialism will ultimately make its way uh, back uh, to politics, um, to power uh, and domination and the apparatuses uh, that organize and determine our lives. For my purposes today, I will hope to say that I hope, um, or I, I will say that I hope that feminism finds its way back to the family, uh, to a critique of the family, uh, but also to a theory of the family that seeks to understand its relationship to capitalism and the state. Um, this category of the family I see is absolutely central to Althusser across his long career, not only in the celebrated theory of ideology and the state, which I'll talk about in brief in a moment, but also evident in his early writings as a young Hegelian I guess we all go through that phase and Catholic activist uh, who was repelled by what he described as conjugal obscenity or the flaunted repressive familialism of his peers in the Catholic youth movement, right? The obscene, what he took to be the obscene show of one's private life in public. Uh, 
Um, the family of the category central to his thinking, I think, is also quite clear in his readings in the history of political thought, um, especially in his uh, treatment of Montesquieu, where the relationship of father and son becomes the template for a post-feudal theory of society. In the reflections on psychoanalysis, where Althusser precisely rejects an account of Freudian science as developmental psychology, the psychology of infant stages, right? That very familiar reading of psychoanalysis and is instead interested in the concept of the unconscious as the architecture of domination. Also evident in his critique of Levi-Strauss, where I think Althusser insists upon thinking the family in its relationship to the mode of production and perhaps uncharacteristically insists upon a historical account of the family in its shifting dynamics and requirements. On a more metatextual level, we could say uh, that the family sort of features in the representation or a kind of familialism or an anti-familialism more precisely features in his representation of Marx and Freud as fatherless sons and the pursuit of a bastard history of the sciences, a bastard history of the sciences, which might be itself uh, subjected to a kind of feminist psychoanalytic reading, right? That revolves around the absent mother, but which I would tend to see in terms of an anti-familialist current that runs across his work. Moreover, just as an aside, I will say that I've always found this idea of a bastard history which is also, I think, taken up by Ranciere in Proletarian Nights. I found this idea or image of bastard history uh, much preferable to that of the so-called underground current. And yet I think that they're trying to get at the same thing. So I'm interested in this double argument that we get at, uh, that we get in Althusser. Um, an argument about the historical life of the family and indeed an insistence on the historicity of the family and an argument also about an eternal structure that knows no history, right? Which is not to say that it is hardwired, right? As developmental or evolutionary psychology suggests, or that it is etched into origins as idealist anthropology suggests. Right, but that it knows no origins or ends beyond itself. That it endures in part for the fact that it precedes us and positions us and alas, anticipates our patterns of resistance. Let me make a few assertions, which I hope will kick off a discussion. Um, I uh, sort of uh, wrote up these remarks very much in the spirit of launching a discussion rather than uh, presenting a fully uh, developed uh, paper with arguments. So these assertions are not really developed as arguments, although in q and I'm happy to find out what interested you in these assertions and do a little bit more precise argumentation. I'll sort of put the polemic first. Uh, first, the theory of ideology, Althusser's celebrated theory of ideology is a theory of politics and the state. A theory of where politics occurs and the theory of the state as a machinery of domination. It is not primarily a theory of the subject, but a critique of a politics that begins from the subject as opposed to beginning from its conditions of necessity. And I precisely say conditions of necessity and not conditions of possibility, because I think Althusser was quite suspicious of that whole language of conditions of possibility, <laughs> much more interested in fact in conditions of necessity. Related to this claim, I would say that Althusser's concept of social reproduction, contra the main currents in social reproduction feminism, Althusser's concept of social reproduction is a theory of politics and not a theory of labor. Indeed, I take this as one of the principal virtues of the Althusserian concept of social reproduction. That it is a political theory of the state and not 
a social theory of labor. This political theory of the state, I would argue, revolves centrally around the family. The family is a first order, and let me, I, I would say that there's a kind of a few different components to, to this. The family is a first order importance in the historical life of the ISAs in Western Europe, which Althusser notes, witnesses a shift from the family church ISA, right? And a legacy of resistance centered on anti-clerical struggle to the family school ISA and the emergence of uh, a kind of um, anti-authoritarian politics that forms around the school. Now, it's sort of interesting to note that, um, that, that uh, a, a legacy of resistance for Althusser does not emerge within the family and does not center on the family, which you might have thought, uh, given uh, its uh, supremacy um, and its endurance, uh, as a kind of ideological structure. We might say with Althusser that the family changes its form, uh, but never uh, loses its supremacy, neither in the structure of ideology, nor in the lived experience, you'll forgive me the term, of ideology. The family for Althusser uh, is, eternal, right? Which is not to say that it is without a history or uh, unchangeable, um, but precisely that it is not subject uh, to the law of origins and ends. So I think I'm interested in that uh, sort of argument that we get um, in uh, the treatment of ideology, right? Sort of everybody, you know, we're, we're all kind of familiar with this argument that ideology uh, is eternal. Um, and I'm trying to suggest that the family has a, a kind of supreme uh, place in the structure of ideology and is also uh, eternal. But that does not mean for him that it is uh, sort of without a history uh, or that it is unchanging or unchangeable, um, but that uh, it is paradoxically not itself subject to the law of origins and ends. So I'm quite interested in the family as perhaps that um, mechanism through which we organize origins and ends that is not itself subject to that imperative. But that's very speculative. Fourth, I think assertion. <laughs> There is an Althusser a powerful critique of two different ways of thinking the relationship of the family to the state or the family apparatus to the theory of the state. Um, one, I think erroneous way of thinking this relationship would be Hegelian, the Hegelian way, which I think, um, it is, it, I mean, Assad did a sort of wonderful elaboration on the sort of the, the problems of the, the simple dialectic in Hegel. Um, but I think also thinking specifically in terms of the family and the state, um, that uh, a Hegelian uh, sort of way of, of thinking that, that the relationship of the family, the state and capitalism would commit itself uh, to a temporality that Althusser precisely rejects in which the state first opposes and then subsumes the principle or the philosophy of the family under its uh, order. The other, I think, way of thinking about the relationship of the family to the state would want be one that is um, perhaps uh, Leibnizian, although the real philosophers can correct me on this, um, but this would cast the relationship of the family to the state in terms of a kind of um, expressive totality Right, and so my own challenge in thinking with Althusser about the family apparatus is to think in terms of uh, these different levels of integration and analysis, um, multiple temporalities, um, and what uh, this means for thinking simultaneously the profound transformations in the historical life of the family and, and alongside uh, 
its remarkable durability and strength. Fifth, there is an explicit critique of familialism in Althusser um, that casts, that casts uh, the family um, as that agency uh, that not only props up uh, the school, first the church and then the school, but is itself a potent political formation. So I'll bring our attention for a moment to note 33 on the reproduction of capitalism. I'm just gonna read for a little bit. It's a nice little footnote. He says, for a laugh, although it is in fact no laughing matter, let us note that while every school child, orphans accepted, has a mother and a father, not every mother and father considers themselves, thank God, the parent of a school child. To come forward as the parent of a school child is a political act, by virtue of which one joins this or that association with a certain political tendency, obviously. What is going on in families these days should be of far greater concern for our vice principals than what's going on in schools. The reader will do, what, do well to recall this when we speak, as we shall in a moment, of a certain school family dyad. It's also no wonder that in comparison with the big brouhaha, I really do have to see the original, I wonder <laughs> how brouhaha was translated or <laughs> if that was his term. In comparison with the big brouhaha about disorders in the schools, I wonder if the discussion of what's going on in families is much more discreet. Althusser continues and wraps up this way. Family business is settled in the privacy of the family. It is in fact, as if some parents of school children were demanding that the state settle the problems that they're having in their own families with their own children by restoring order in the schools. These are things that really should be kept hush hush for if they were not, would we not have to admit that in a certain regard, the family does indeed have something to do with the ideological state apparatus. And that the class struggle produces some of its effects in families. Okay, so I guess the kind of whole of my engagement and interest in Althusser is to ask what it would mean to read this hush hush symptomatically. What about the family must be kept quiet? And here I refer not only to the patterns of violence and abuse that must be kept secret in order for the family ideology to survive, but I refer to the role of the family in reproducing order amidst disorder. I wanna ask how the family is formed and deformed by the class struggle. And given its supreme role in the architecture of the capitalist state, how do we think the family in Althusserian terms as a site of struggle that behind the theater of politics is this everyday institution where we have our most direct contact with the state and with its ideological epistemolo epistemological structure. And it's here that I would want to bring Althusser's thinking into contact with the work of Cedric Robinson, especially his brilliant and understudied first book, The Terms of Order, which represents in my view, a powerful contribution to the critique of this ideological epistemological structure, and which also treats the family and its relations as central and centrally organizing of our political universe. And then finally, but in a very speculative last remark, I wanna suggest that there is an underdeveloped, indeed muted or silent critique of patriarchy in Althusser, a critique of a patriarchy or form of patriarchalism that persists even without fathers or in the absence of fathers, that there is indeed um, an understanding and anticipation of uh, a kind of new humanism to take 
uh, root politically as a kind of familialism. And I'm interested in uh, sort of amplifying that part of Althusser's project uh, that I think represents um, uh, a kind of radical uh, anti-familialist uh, current. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Robin. That's a very, your paper is wonderfully provocative and opens up so many original avenues. Um, so as we did this morning, we'll take just a, a five, a short break, five minutes or so. People need to get up or get a drink of water or something. Um, and then we'll come back for Q&A um, to pose questions just. All right, so as we, as we come back from the break, um, we have um, 50 minutes, I think, for questions, so we have plenty of time. Um, right now we have only two questions. So uh, we have questions from Daniel Tut, CR High, um, and we'll go in that order. Um, why don't we uh, take two questions and that, the, take those first two questions and then open up the floor again. Should I go? Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. All right. Um, well, congratulations to the organizers and to Assad and Robin for great papers. Um, Robin, I really like your uh, paper a lot. Um, I've thought about this myself. I think perhaps maybe one thing we could examine here is Althusser's relation to Lacan. In Lacan's own notion, even of the name of the father, in Lacan's own idea, of paternity and of, of, of the family it's, itself, um, going back many years. The fact that Althusser was so interested in Lacan but kept a certain distance to a lot of Lacanian thought. I think perhaps one answer to this kind of um, immutable uh, category of the family as a, uh, in the way that you stated it, I think you stated it very well, makes a lot of sense to me. I think also the, the fact that Lacan was barred from the IPA around his concept of the name of the father and the fact that that concept was so significant for Althusser in his own biographical writings, when he says this very fascinating point, which I think gets under the skin of a lot of Althusserian scholars, where he says, I became a father to my students, even though I didn't have a father myself, right? Um, so there's something about Lacan, I think that may, may um, provide uh, the answer there. And then I would also say um, Camille Ropesick's work at Columbia on the way in which familialism was utilized by the French state cross, in a cross-partisan way, um, specifically Lacan's teaching on the family, um, gives credence there. And even Balibar makes the nice point that in Lacan's theory of Oedipus, um, even the communists could identify with it because the family was almost preserved as a necessary site for the state's stability and in its preservation of stability, uh, its, um, its capacity itself somehow retained. It, was, it wasn't necessarily compromised. And so obviously then the, the notion of the Americanization uh, or marketization, uh, which was then starting, posed a grand threat. So in some sense, maybe Althusser could be read, not to make an arbitrary distinction between the state and the market, but certainly could be read as almost thinking in some sense that the preservation of the, of the state and the nation and the family um, has almost like a neutral effect on politics. Anyways, those are just some thoughts. I wanted to see what you think about the connection to Lacan though. Should we take another question or should I um, answer? What, what's your preference? It's, it's, up, it's up to you. Uh, Sarhai had a question for Assad. Um, so yeah, why don't we take them together and then you can respond. Um. Uh, yes, I have a question and thank you both for uh, great papers. Um, my question for Assad is one element in this fascinating story of uh, placing dialectic and uh, uh, class struggle in different modalities. I cannot quite put my finger on uh, one moment that you did not mention, perhaps you can help me. Namely, Stalin's uh, great uh, theoretical innovation, that the more we build socialism, 
the more acute class struggle becomes. Uh, why do I say uh, this is because I always thought of it uh, as a kind of quite genuine idea of the symptom. So now class struggle becomes as a symptom. You, once in a while, some bourgeois proclivity comes, you have to repress it quite, uh, quite literally. And your conclusion uh, that class struggle is a symptom, of course, in the Althusserian sense, in a very precise sense uh, that you're using it, uh, sparked uh, this conflict uh, for me. And so I cannot quite put my finger on it. Can, uh, can, do you have perhaps ideas about it? Have you thought about it and so on? Daniel, thank you for um, the question. I think first, let me just say, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think um, Lacan is um, is a, a crucial piece of the story, not just, I mean, the engagement with psychoanalysis broadly um, and and what he what he learns from Lacan. I also think related to that and in reference to Camille Robstis's brilliant book, I mean, there's also the engagement with Levi Strauss. And so it's important, I think, to to separate those, but I think also to consider them together in some ways, insofar as if we buy Robeson's argument, Lacan and Levi-Strauss together form um, the kind of intellectual foundations of a certain articulation of the French national project. Now, the other thing I would say about her work, I mean, I, I just can't speak hi highly enough of her work. And we'll notice that in her very brief treatment of Althusser, she's, she's also quite, sensitive and careful and sort of notes, I think the important points of disagreement that Althusser will have with some of these structuralist thinkers and therefore then the consequences for his ability to think beyond the parameters of civic republicanism, which I think she uh, sort of thinks that, 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 um, uh, that, that, that sort of those who are narrowly informed by uh, a kind of Levi-Straussian or Lacanian framework in France are sort of confined to this um, political republicanism. And, and I would say that she's, she's equally strong sort of in her brief remarks on Althusser, uh, her brief um, references to Deleuze and Guattari, where I think she's quite sensitive in um, in distilling a very rich debate that is occurring among friends and comrades who are otherwise learning from one another. Um, I would also say uh, that um, what I'm interested in is how Althusser engages Lacan and Lacanian psychoanalysis for, from my perspective, a concept of the state and a theory of politics. And so it, it represents a different way into the Lacanian problematic. Um, and I'm sort of interested in how Lacanian feminists have taken up or failed to take up questions of politics in the state in that regard, right? So I'm sort of interested in that whole territory. All of this to say uh, that if we have another year of lockdown, uh, I'm open to the Lacan, the Lacanian reading group. Like I'm open to the study of Lacan and sort of filling out uh, the story that I want to tell here about uh, the critique of patriarchy uh, in Althusser uh, with reference to its, uh, to its father. One uh, clarification, did, 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 you, did you mean to attribute this view to, to Stalin or Mao? Uh, to Stalin. Okay. To Stalin. Okay, so I mean in, um, in Stalin's conception, any uh, change in social relations of this kind is still subordinated to the development of the productive forces. I mean, this is what he, he in dialectical and historical materialism, he's, uh, he says, whatever retroactive action there is and so on, it always comes back to that. So the theory of, uh, the theory which accompanies the repression, uh, I don't know that, there is a fully developed theory. There is, uh, you know, there's often uh, uh, an account of deviations. There's uh, an account of foreign enemies, collusion with foreign enemies. Um, I don't think that there is a fully developed theory of this uh, until Mao. And in Mao, there is a complicated development because 
as I briefly mentioned, uh, for a significant period, it's not quite the same as talking about uh, foreign enemies or just about deviations, but there's it, the theory of contradiction is brought to contradictions among the people. There are antagonistic, non-antagonistic contradictions, and there are contradictions between the people and the enemy. And so it's brought into this um, earlier philosophy. Uh, and so the, the, the possibility of the restoration of capitalism comes from the reactionary convictions, the reactionary politics of these uh, actors. And sometimes it's not that different from Stalin's version. But then uh, in the 60s, he begins to introduce this idea that there is uh, a class struggle in socialism. And so the, there's first of all the remnants of the bourgeoisie, but then there's the idea that socialism can engender new classes. And so there, there is both, I mean, you, the, both of these uh, phenomena become part of this theory of the ongoing class struggle. First, the remnants, which uh, survivals and so on, Althusser talks about survivals, then new classes generated uh, by the bureaucracy, by the division between manual and intellectual labor that persists and so on. Um, the problem is that um, it's, it's difficult to uh, actually establish an alignment between the antagonistic political positions in China in the 60s and the different sociological groups that we might identify as classes. And uh, a huge problem in this period is also the fact that uh, many class categories have been completely turned upside down uh, by, uh, by changes in ownership relations and in the attempt to change the division of labor. So they become inherited traits. And so you have uh, good class backgrounds and bad class backgrounds. This is a major point of violence in the cultural revolution. So in this sense, I mean, I think there are changing theories um, and uh, yeah, that, that's the, the class struggle does not uh, map on to the political antagonisms that are, are at work. Thank you. Um, we have questions from Caroline Siegler and Vedana. Um, so Caroline, uh, if you, you're, you. Yes, hello, can everyone hear me? Okay, awesome. So I have two questions. Um, the first for Professor Morasco, um, just when you talk about, um, you know, finding an Althusser, a political theory of the state rather than a social theory of labor, I wonder if you could just talk more on to, like as to what the difference is between those two concepts, because I could imagine them uh, being united as the, as the same concept at the end of the day. And so as like kind of a piggyback to that question, I would like to ask Assad if maybe this goes along with the kind of um, the extent to which uh, you discuss the notion of, you know, it being economic in the last instance, if that being a vacuous kind of concept. I wonder if there's any overlap there and how Professor Moresco uh, differentiates her thinking of the political theory of the state from a social theory of labor. And then my second question is just to Professor Morasco, when you consider the family, um, I guess I just wonder the extent you consider the family as a threat to the state rather than something that just kind of goes along with it or as a kind of a, a, like a satellite of the state just because the like in many instances familial structures are much more ancient than the kind of nationalism and and state boundaries that define how we think of the state and a nation today and just because um family structures have often like been a challenge to this kind of notion of the state like a legal challenge through like immigration and marriage and, and intermarriage between you know different groups of people different religions but then also as an ideological threat on a kind of more under uh, a less spoken about way through the question of, of nepotism and how that prov like provides a challenge to the notion of the market and a kind of like uh, meritocratic American society, if that makes sense at all. And we have a question from the Vedana. Um, 
which I will read uh, for Assad. Um, you mentioned mystifying formulation that never comes in relation to the theory of determination in the, in the last instance. Could you please explain the meaning of mystification? Okay, and so with those two questions, uh, I'll give it back to our speakers. Maybe I'll um, just say very briefly, you know, what's at stake for me in saying um, that uh, I think Althusser's concept of representation opens to a theory of politics and the state and a political theory of the state, not a social theory of labor. Uh, I think here it's probably a critique of, um, of the, the kind of the mainstream of social, the so-called social reproduction feminism, which I think tends to see uh, the family um, as a labor relationship, as, um, and, and, in, and indeed sees reproduction, right? The concept of reproduction um, is that specific kind of labor that is usually or typically unwaged that occurs in the home. And so you get, I think, very powerful and valuable accounts of the distribution of the unequal, unwaged, unfair distribution of labor in the household. But I'm interested in something else about the family, um, which I think is more likely to turn on concepts of authority and concepts of order, the experience of violence, these are things I think, by the way, are um, almost entirely neglected by social reproduction feminism, I will say, that um, they uh, tend to have a kind of overly idealized depiction of the kind of work the, of course, unwaged and unequal care work that occurs in the family. And so the family really becomes um, the, the site for this kind of labor that is distorted and degraded by capitalist relations. And it's just not how I see the family and not how I see the Althusserian or the uses of an Althusserian concept of reproduction, which are, I mean, I guess this is what I mean about um, a political theory of the state, that what is being sort of reproduced in the family is order authority, patterns of rule, um, experiences and propensities toward violence. And these are some of the um, sort of, I mean, I, I actually think that Al Althusser gives us a number of concepts that we might sort of get at some of these um, elements of the family. We sort of think about his mature articulation of this idea of a primitive political accumulation that he wants to sort of think separately from kind of e the arguments about e economic accumulation. So maybe that's another opportunity. I don't wanna say that this is the, that the, the, the Althusserian notion of reproduction is the only place, but what I wanna say is that something is lost if our concept of social reproduction is entirely oriented around the organization of labor. And that, um, and that it's precisely the Althusserian concept of reproduction that gives us something more and that opens to uh, what I'm tempted to call uh, the politics of the family or a political concept of the family. That aspect of the family that is not simply about the organization of labor and the distribution uh, of property, right? But, um, but also the circulation and distribution of um, authority, if you'll uh, forgive me the, that term. It, it's, it's not that, I don't see the family as ever disruptive of the state, certainly wouldn't um, want to say that. Um, but I do think that what Althusser is interested in and his concept of ideology is, um, is what he will uh, cast in, in terms of, of the ordinary, of sort of everyday life. And, and maybe this also allows me to kind of get a little bit back to Daniel's question. Like I, I find it, I, it is one of the things about Althusser I quite appreciate that he allows us to sort of think the politics of everyday life 
but but not in a sociological register. Like he's sort of allowing us to think about um, these uh, primary relations of so-called everyday life where we are assimilated into and integrated into um, the, the sort of structure of our world, but are not necessarily uh, reducible uh, to the kind of available repertoire uh, of, of sociological concepts. Now, for a thinker who I think really wants to press on the distinction or the tension between the family and the state, that I mean, that I think you'll find much more on somebody like Ranciere, who I think actually is much more open to the possibilities harbored in the, um, the simultaneous emancipation of father and son, uh, much more a, a sort of open and hospitable to a kind of radical possibility that's harbored within the family and sits uh, in, in some kind of tension, if not opposition to the requirements of the state. Um, I just, for myself, I, I don't, I, I don't see that as as, as Al to Sarah's way of um, sort of thinking about uh, the 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 sort of place of of the family ideologically, politically, uh, or, or even uh, sort of metaphysically. But I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to say that the family is never uh, disruptive of the of the machinery of the state. I think it is. Um, though uh, in its uh, sort of basic uh, mechanisms and machinery, uh, not that. As far as the family form that precedes the state, I mean, it, you know, it's a, first there's this whole question of origins, which I think is sort of difficult to think in reference to Althusser. I do really think he wants us in a very provocative way to sort of think, um, sort of how to sort of think uh, what, what some of our earlier panelists, I think very sort of brilliantly talk about as multiple temporalities kind of without or outside of uh, the language of, of origins or ends. And um, so I'm not, I'm not sure. For myself though, I have wondered whether we can so neatly separate um, the origins of the state from the family and the development of the family. I'm much uh, less certain that, um, I mean, it, I, I, you know, we don't necessarily have to like talk about the Bronze Ages, but like we, you know, the Bronze Age, but like we could talk about the Bronze Age and like, I'm, I'm sort of like such a novice to this literature, but I'm like sort of thinking that actually what we see in sort of early states is something like what I think would be unsurprising to Gail Rubin, which is the elementary structure of kinship. And, um, and so I, I, I'm very worried about that line of argument. And I think Althusser cautions me precisely against that line of argument. Um, but I also think that if, you, if we do wanna venture into the kind of anthropology of the family and the state that we might find that 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 those projects are more intertwined than we had expected maybe so on uh, determination the last instance uh it's you know it's always a remarkable experience to read this passage and uh to wonder what it could possibly mean um I, if, I think maybe Warren is listening in, I don't know. Uh, he provides, a, I think, a good um, uh, account of this with reference to Balibar's development of the concept from Foucault of the point of heresy, the, the point in a doctrine where you have just irreconcilable positions that are coming from the same premises and uh, uh, a, a paradox, and uh, in the kind of religious sense of, uh, in, of encountering such a point of heresy, one is, uh, it's a mystery, and one is mystified. Uh, this is the, so <laughs> this is the sense, I think, in which it is mystifying, in, not in the sense of uh, some 
agent obscuring uh, our social relations or even uh, some kind of uh, objective relation like fetishism or something like that. This is not a matter of uh, distortion or of, of, of essences and appearances, but of, of the mystery that's encountered when you reach a paradox in the doctrine. And it's not possible to reconcile them. It's not possible to resolve this. Uh, what happens instead is that Althusser shifts uh, to talking about structural causality. And there uh, we are no longer, um, we're no longer talking about, um, let's say what could be interpreted, what was often uh, interpreted uh, in the reception as the basis of coming up with some kind of combinatory, some kind of schema in which, you know, there are the different levels and then there's the economic which determines the relation between the levels, something like that. Instead, we just shift to a conception of causes that exist in their effects. And we no longer have this uh, uh, determination of some uh, independently existing uh, uh, network of causes. Thank you, thank you both. Um, so uh, we have another round of questions. Um, just trying to figure out exactly how to best organize them. Um, so we have a question uh, from Ken. Uh, you still, are you still there, Ken? Uh, I, I think we'll do them one, one by one now. Uh, and then um, just in the interest of sort of. Thanks, yeah, I wanna say thank you for uh, letting me uh, be part of this and and uh, Haida Assad, we've been emailing lately and it's been really nice to hear him uh, talk. And I have a question, I'm trying to, you know, um, have us try to synthesize these two papers actually, um, Assad and Robbins. And for me, it comes down to, I guess, the question of transition and then this question of family. But what I wanted to just kind of frame the question in, in terms of, you know, first things first, the basic thing is obviously we want a revolutionary transition from capitalism to communism. Socialism is a kind of a intermediary period of a dictatorship of the proletariat where according to Marx's critique of the Goethe program, we're gonna be living with a lot of bourgeois remnants, you know, bourgeois rights. And so, you know, after the revolution, we have to, or working towards the revolution or working through the revolution, we got to deal with these bourgeois remnants that are going to keep getting in the way. Um, and having said that, then, <clears throat> you know, where is the place of the family in that? Um, and if it's not simply a question, and I and and my, I'm not sure if it's a quibble or a semantic thing, or it could be a really big conceptual thing. But when Robin, when you say that you want to think of um, social reproduction theory, not simply as a theory of social, of labor, but for example, of authority and violence and so on, which I think is totally necessary. Um, but of course, Marx would say, of course, we're not talking about labor, a theory of labor. That's like what Ricardo did, you know, what we, what I, Marx, and have invented actually is a concept of labor power. Uh, and so, social reproduction theory should really be a theory about labor power and not simply about labor, but it's, so then the question is, what really is labor power, which Althusser also hammered away on in reading Capital by saying, yeah, you know, we're not talking about labor. We're talking about labor power, which is totally different really from labor. Um, and so if we, if this can be admitted, um, then I think the question can be, you know, really then is what is the relation between the state and labor power, um, perhaps through the family, you know, through um, authority in the family, through violence in the family, um, you know, and, and perhaps that could open up to, to, an, an, to the final part of the question, which would be really how can we combine, you know, what we, we, we've been talking about in Assad's paper and, and your paper, Robin, um, the proletariat. <laughs> I mean, how, how can we rethink this concept of the proletariat? 
Um, of course, the late Althusser, I particularly find him so uh, uh, inspiring because he's, he's uh, especially after, you know, the, the 70s, he, he really goes after the party and the Marxist dogma and says, you know, basically we should abandon the idea of the proletariat as the exploited and should look at it as the expropriated and look at you know the, the social formation not from the perspective of the accomplished facts but from the fact to be accomplished you know so those are the parameters of my question i just wanted to really you know put put back on the table question of transition meaning we got to deal with bourgeois remnants and try to eliminate them uh, systematically question of labor power and never simply simply labor although we should really, I think, try to, I, I'm looking for a theory to try to develop these concepts, labor and labor power. And then the big one, of course, is how to think of the proletariat. So I would like to put it back to you guys. Thank you. Would you like to begin, Pascal, or do you want me to? I can. Um, um, these are very interesting questions because, um, you know, when Althusser launches his campaign in defense of the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat, I mean, there are a number of things going on. Uh, there is a strategic response to the idea of uh, communist organizations being internal to the state. And you know, this is the idea that just he wants to completely uh, uh, reject and undermine and that, that, you know, they're, they're, that uh, there is a possibility of a practice of politics which is outside the state. And then there is the, uh, and it's interesting that he talks about dictatorship without getting into um, what, it, meant etymologically and so on, but uh, he just says it, it, it refers to domination, to class domination. And so if you lose the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat, you lose the concept of the bourgeois dictatorship, which is the dictator, which is the domination of the bourgeois. So that, uh, it seems to me that it's in these contexts, strangely enough, the dictatorship of the proletariat is a concept is what allows you to understand capitalist society, the class domination of capitalist society. And it's what allows you to understand um, the, uh, the, the way that the existing state is the, is, is the form of capitalist domination. You can't, communist politics can't operate through it. But I don't know that in this, uh, in, in what he says about it, that he really uh, presents uh, an account of what it means for the transition. Uh, and in some ways that maybe that is missing there. And I think, I think that when, when you look at it from the vantage point of the transition, the dictatorship of the proletariat, uh, it's actually um, an, an, an index of an absence, which is that we don't really know uh, what form of politics in the transition will actually result in communism. And it's not reducible to eliminating the bourgeois remnants, uh, which uh, sometimes was invoked. But you know, the, how is it that you'll have uh, an institute or a set of institutions or a set of practices which lead to their own abolition? That's a very that's a very difficult question. We could give it a verbal solution by saying, you know, the the ideas for the state to where they're away and so on. But it's not. It doesn't. We know it does not happen spontaneously. So I think that the what is interesting about the Cultural Revolution is the extent to which this became in a, a very uh, concrete uh, and central problem. And actually, the one of the last. Uh, initiatives of Mao uh, uh, was the um, uh, campaign for the study of the theory of the dictatorship of the proletariat. And if you look online, you can find some great propaganda posters of factories in which the workers are reading about the dictatorship of the proletariat. But it was kind of, it wasn't that we want to um, uh, 
reinforce this theory, but we don't actually know what the status is of this concept in the actual process of transition. And so I think what, what, what we find is that uh, in order to have a transition which can actually undermine the existence of the state and can create new forms of life, egalitarian forms of life, you need a process of invention. And uh, what that means is that you will not necessarily be able to explain that using the class categories that were valid for capitalist society. And this, so, so it now becomes, and once again, I would, I would not want to get into the language of levels and what's in determinations and so on, but I would, I would speak of a kind of uh, autonomy of politics in this case, in which there has to be the possibility of political organizations that are capable of inventing new forms. And the, the party state was the limit on that. Because every time that it went, every time that, this, that these new practices were redirected into the language of class struggle, into the language of the seizure of power, and the dictatorship of proletariat, uh, the, the, the innovation was restricted. And that's the kind of contradictory uh, character of the concept in the transition. Thank you, Ken, for, for um, that set of questions and remarks and very helpful. Um, maybe I would say, um, two things, although I don't think I have a complete uh, response. One thing about um, sort of labor power and the other about this, this point of transitions and, um, and what Assad was elaborating as kind of inventive or experimental modes of political organization um, in, in transition. So I, I guess even on labor power, um, you know, for me, I'm really interested in, uh, you know, the family as, as sort of organizing and, and sort of ordering or suppressing that power. And so, um, and, and I guess I'm interested in what you think or, or how you think the concept of labor power might bring into view all of the things that I'm trying to suggest kind of fall out of view in a kind of, in a, the, the sort of conventional like social reproduction story. I mean, my, my sort of main issue is I actually think that that, um, that social, the, the social reproduction line in feminism that treats um, or that defends an argument about or elaborates an argument about household labor ultimately has to fall back on a kind of idealized conception of the household. That it has to fall into this, um, actually even as it's um, sort of inventors and architects imagine that they were speaking against and arguing against a kind of dual systems approach, I would argue that social reproduction theory has a kind of dual systems approach of its own that has to imagine that the kind of household, that the labor that occurs in the household is something radically different from the wage labor that occurs outside of that, the household. And you'll find often, I think, a somewhat um, kind of um, protective uh, orientation to the household, which I, I don't have. And I don't, and, and I'm really trying to kind of think ag against. And so, um, and so I think, so if, if what you would wanna to say to me is like, you know, that account of that sort of sociological account of labor has like nothing to do with Marx, <laughs> nothing to do with what Marx contributes to a critique of capitalism. I might be, I, I would be inclined to agree with that. But nevertheless, I think a, a, a certain contemporary articulation of Marxist feminism today tends to treat the family as if it is simply a mode of organizing and distributing labor unfairly and unequally um, and uh, passing down uh, property. 
right? And so sort of the family is either labor relation or property relation. And sort of that, I, I think you can also see that argument is consistent with a certain vulgar or orthodox Marx, a certain kind of economistic Marxism that would say like, well, what does the family do? Well, the family sort of organizes labor and it distributes property or, or ensures the, the successful distribution uh, of, of property. And, um, and I want to say, I, I want to maybe with Fanon in this way, sort of stretch the Marxian analysis somewhat, or at least a conventional Marxian analysis and say that um, actually somebody like Althusser gives us re resources for thinking um, the family is a political institution. And I would even be inclined to use that language of institution, even though Althusser doesn't himself use that, but it would be precisely to kind of um, uh, accentuate that political <laughs> interpretation of the apparatus against uh, what I think of are, are some of um, the readings that, that, that I'm arguing against. This point about transition is really um, interesting and fascinating, and I don't have a satisfactory, any kind of satisfactory re response to it, but I will say, I think it's interesting how, you know, these kind of experiments, these are sort of experiments in uh, sort of revolutionary or militant familialism that you can find in the sort of whole, I mean, we're talking about sort of the, the politics of, of communist history, right? I mean, you can uh, sort of think about, um, uh, you know, sort of Fanon's gloss on the, the young girl who becomes a militant who sort of in that process becomes uh, a, a sister, right? And in, in, that, in that sort of political sense, right? And we can, we're kind of reminded of how the black power movement uh, sort of used uh, the, the term and the language of sister and brother um, as an expression of, of of a, of a political purpose, but we might even say that the, the language of comrade too is suggestive of a familial dream wish, right? Well, sort of remember that the, the term comrade, I think comes from the Spanish term camarada, right? which literally means a roommate or a housemate, um, right? So somebody with whom you share a home who is interestingly not your relative or spouse, right? So it sort of preserves the household as a frame for political thinking, but uh, you could say also has a kind of anti-familialism in its um, articulation. And so it's about precisely establishing one's equal in a household. And I think that, uh, you know, sort of a, con the contemporary uh, kind of resurgence of socialism and communist politics, I think has, um, has fastened to this term comrade, right? We could sort of we will remind ourselves of, of Jody Dean's argument for reviving the language of comrade, right? For her, the language of comrade is preferable to the language of, of allies. For her, the language of allies is this language of identity as opposed to the language of solidarity. Um, right, so, so I'm in, I would be interested precisely in comrade as a kind of transition term, if I would put it that way, like comrade as precisely, or at least the term that captures the kind of um, problematic of the transition that you're describing, um, you know, what uh, historians of revolutionary France, right, will we'll, we'll call the family romance of the French revolutionaries who are sort of trying uh, to think outside of uh, the, the kind of monarchical familialism. Um, and for that reason, uh, defended sort of ideas of fraternity, this kind of alternate familialism. I think I, I would sort of tend to think about at least the discursive, um, the, the, the sort of discursive expressions of that transition in, um, in these kinds of terms, when these terms come kind of back into fashion or seem to be doing a kind of political work for us that we are perhaps in, a, in an experimental, uh, in an inventive arena of politics. Thank you. Um, so we have a bit of a cue. Um, so uh, I would like to ask both of our um, panelists um, 
if it's okay with both of you, if we can go into overtime. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Paniotis had a question for each of you. Okay, Is it? Well, uh, yeah. Congrats. Uh, for excellent presentations well the, the first question is for for robin I, I find it i find it really really interesting how you returned to uh, this idea of the family as an ideological uh, state apparatus which i think is one of the most revolutionary critiques one can find of the family uh, and i was wondering if you could uh, comment uh, on on this i mean Reproduction in Altusser in 1969 has a, a, a very strategic, not, just, not, not only economic, not only political, it has a strategic meaning. So this is Althusser of the 67-69 period. He has done his self-critique in regards to the idea of latent structures. So he has moved a little bit more towards uh, what we later call the, the materialism of the encounter. So relations are encounters. So there's nothing deeper than that. There's no two level uh, kind of society. So relations are encounters, but they, they have to be encounters at last. This notion of the lasting encounter is, is a notion coming from on reproduction. So reproduction by means of apparatuses, material practices, rituals, is exactly uh, Althusser's uh, attempt to rethink the, the, the relative and contingent in a certain way stability of social forms, but also their dynamic of transformation. So I think th this is, th this is uh, I would like to, see, to hear your, 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 your comments or how does this fit into your reading of, repro of, of so reproduction beyond simple social reproduction, especially in regards both to the family and, and the state and, and its uh, it's really interesting how Althusser, in, in a certain way, similarly to Gramsci's notion of hegemonic apparatus, connects the state to the family. It's, it's a, so this is the first. And the question to uh, Assad is this. Uh, I was uh, really, <laughs> really fascinated by, by how you, remi you reminded us of, of a very interesting philological aspect. We're talking about the 63-64 text, the 1963 text, the, 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 the epitome of, of, of high Althusserianism, the Althusserianism of the conjuncture of the of a highly original, new, a, a, a novel theory of social totality, and at the same time of the conjuncture and political intervention. All this, as in a certain way, an indirect critique, and not so indirect critique of the Stalinist conception of, of politics, especially in Western Europe, and this kind of uh, combination of parliamentarism with economy. And the philological references are one text by Stalin, actually the, the 1924 lecture uh, on uh, at, at the Sveldrov University, the lecture on the, uh, that defines Leninism and has this really interesting presentation of the idea of, of the missing, of the weakest link of the chain. So, and then Mao, texts that are really more about the complexities of building social alliances. I mean, a, a great part of, 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 of initial dialectical texts of Mao have to do more of how to deal with building alliances, uh, reading a society, understanding the difference. So I was wondering, how do you, how, how do you, what's your take on this, 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 this gap separating the philological references and this very highly original theory of, of the conjecture how do they they, they fit in because uh, and I, I and i would also like to say that it, it's interesting how you mentioned that even the notion of, of class struggle within socialism that Althusser and the Althusserians use is rather different than the initial maoist one with this idea of class as class background class uh, class origin rather than class class practice actual, which is also one of the tensions within uh, cultural revolution. Anyway, anyway that, that's the question. And again, con congrats for, for, for fantastic presentation. I'll be brief. This was just a, a terrific question. Um, and I think uh, here is what I will say. I find it very helpful to think um, the philosophy of the encounter or the elaborations on aleatory materialism in terms of 
uh, the encounter that uh, takes hold, right? So, so, Al so Althusser is very interested in, um, it's, it's precisely not right chance, it's not a philosophy of chance, it's precisely the philosophy of chance taking hold as necessity. And I think that's very interesting, it's a very interesting argument. I think it's easily, uh, at least in my own experience of teaching Althusser, it's, it's easily misread by, by uh, students initially because what they, what they find and what they first discover in Althusser is radical contingency and the void and everything is the throw of the dice. And, um, and as I read it, that is um, sort of half of the, half of the story. <laughs> Um, but the other half of the story is the story of the taking hold, that, that the, the process he's really trying to describe is the process by which chance takes hold as necessity and comes to impress itself uh, upon the world that it has created as uh, necessity. And I think it's actually very interesting to think about the family, both the we might say the sort of early anthropology of the family, but even our very mundane everyday experiences of the family as chance encounters that have taken hold as necessity and organized their world sort of as necessity, but without sort of thinking or being able to really like develop that fully. I will also wanna say that the other point you made is very rich, this point about stab stability and, and transition or sort of thinking the site of simultaneous continuity um, and transition. And I will just note only that this is precisely how Max Horkheimer thinks the family in its relationship to politics and the state, right? In his elaborations on authority and the family says, why, why would a social scientist care about the family. Well, it turns out for Horkheimer, at least, the family is that institution um, that organizes patterns of continuity and transition. In other words, sort of stabilizes continuities and opens up historical transitions. So for Horkheimer, at least, the family is becomes sort of important for the social scientist precisely for thinking um, uh, sort of endurance in history and thinking historical change. And what you're suggesting to me, although uh, it hadn't occurred to me, is that there's actually resources in the mature Althusser uh, to try to get at um, a similar sort of problem area or problem terrain, but maybe with a different set of theoretical resources. So thank you for that. Yeah, so this is a very important question and it gets to something that is crucial to me about what is distinctive about Althusser. Before I address this, I, I wanted to pick up on the a previous thing about uh, comrades. It reminded me immediately of um, an interview with Foucault in 1966, in which, uh, which is not in English. I mean, he's saying, um, uh, he's, he's going on a diatribe against humanism. Humanism is the main enemy you know, the, uh, the, the Western powers, the Soviet Union, they're all pushing humanism. And then he says something about, uh, just look at Althusser and his courageous comrades in the Communist Party who are fighting against humanism there. Uh, and so I just translated it as comrades, but he uses the word compagnon, which is not the communist word, but the anarchist word. <laughs> and so it's very interesting that he's projected this word and it's interesting how there are these two words in, uh, in the French revolutionary history, uh, etymologically breaking bread, right, compagnon. Uh, but then before that, you had the word citizen, and that was the uh, revolutionary form of address. I think it's something interesting about how these all these different words become, uh, let, well, maybe we'll say, in, in a revolutionary interpolation. Anyway, to uh, Paniotis's question. Uh, let me frame this in terms of methods of reading, um, which uh, certainly it's laid out uh, very explicitly in reading capital that we have a problem of how to read. And uh, it's clearly elaborated. What we get in both four marks in reading capital is that uh, 
to be able to read and to identify the specificity of a thought, you need to understand the problematic. And this is why you should read the young Marx, this is why you should read Feuerbach, because if you don't, then you don't understand the problematic and you don't understand what actually is original about the thought later. And uh, so this is important, but we also see um, many other uh, kinds of uh, uh, attempts to produce different readings of Marx's texts of capital in the same period. So one would be the Neue Marx Lecture in Germany. And there they establish a division between what they will call the, the worldview Marxism or traditional Marxism, which had a particular interpretation of capital and which they view as very crude and throughout any reference to Lenin, anybody else is like, this was a misunderstanding of uh, Marx's actual insights. Marx though, he also, you know, even as much as they make claims of continuity, they have to acknowledge that he's inconsistent. In, in capital, he's inconsistent. Sometimes he gives these transhistorical formulations. Sometimes he gives uh, physiological formulations. And so you have to read to figure out what is it that is, um, uh, distinctive about the argument, you have to differentiate what is uh, just him maybe popularizing or vulgarizing or maybe him just inheriting Ricardian concepts and repeating them and so on. So they do this with capital, they do it with Marx. They won't do it with Lenin. And so the person who did this with Lenin was Althusser. And so he took this whole tradition dismissed as worldview Marxism, traditional Marxism and so on and said, we can also read it this way. So if you read and you understand the problematic, someone reads on contradiction now, you look at it and say, okay, this, this all this, like Mao is constantly talking about atoms splitting and you know, this is like, uh, there, there's, there appears to be some basis in natural physical reality for the theory of contradiction. If you understand the whole history leading up to it, you know, this begins with angles that the dialectics of nature is a basic premise. Lenin repeats it, everybody repeats it. And so that's the baseline. If you want to read uh, and figure out what is actually happening in the text, you have to understand this is the problematic and here's where something different happens. And uh, I think uh, Althusser was completely singular in saying we can read th this history this way. And uh, otherwise, it's, you know, uh, you just um, consign these figures to theoretical oblivion. They're, they just appear to be dogmatists. And it's not just uh, Lenin and Stalin and Mao. You read Rosa Luxemburg, she will appear to have just adopted this framework. You have to be able to uh, have a protocol of reading that shows you what is being invented. Thank you. Um, so we're, uh... We still we still have a little bit of a backlog uh, in the queue, but um, some of the questions I think have been addressed in pa in passing. Um, but um, Sterling has a question for Robin, um, which reads um, that he's happy that you mentioned the ISA essay as being a theory of the state and tie this to the question of the family as a site of social reproduction uh, and goes on to ask um, if you might be able to say something more about what Althusser brings to a contemporary theory of the state in the context of more of our more distributed and global era of production of capitalist production um, and then also, we have a very technical question from Hugo, which I will, which as you answer, Robin, I uh, will text it to Assad and we'll do that one next. Um, well, uh, let me, let me see. I mean, it's to think about, um, Althusser's, uh, I think, revolutionary critique of, of, of the family and the context of, of um, the present moment is, is complicated and there are a lot of layers. I mean, one 
would be that we are, uh, you know, we have been for decades now in the midst of a process that we might describe as the kind of familialization of society and politics. And, um, and so it seems to me that an Althusserian account of ideology would have to be one prepared to make sense of that process in relationship to um, uh, economic conditions and to uh, kind of crisis tendencies and the other ideological apparatuses. So, um, so for first thing I would say is that um, that uh, the familialization of of society and of politics is something um, of of interest. I think um, to Althusser. Also, I mean the whole sort of account that Althusser wants to give us of. Um, of family and privacy has arguably been broken down. Um, and actually it's in this context that I find some of his early uh, thinking about the family and his thinking about how um, familialism becomes a kind of political prop for uh, especially repressive and reactionary forms of Catholic politics, I find resonates with our present in all sorts of ways. And I think it might actually be worth revisiting Althusser's reflections on limited though they are, his reflections on the Catholic movement, um, which were obviously a very different political formation than uh, the hyper reactionary form of Catholicism that I think is uh, sort of mounting today. And yet um, I think Althusser becomes a kind of interesting figure to think through um, these surprising resurgences in our time. Um, then I guess finally, I would just wanna say, I mean, what I, what I really want to avoid or what I don't want to um, suggest um, is that the family is some kind of um, uh, uh, so, some kind of flat sort of uniform thing that exists everywhere in the same way and functions according to the same imperatives. Um, and indeed in our own, uh, like in, in sort of this capitalist system, I think the politics of familialism um, cut in very, very interesting and problematic ways on behalf of um, sort of existing hierarchies and structures of domination. And so, so I think the ideological work that the family does um, is, is perhaps very different in very different contexts. And, and I think we, we know that, I mean, so I don't wanna suggest that the family is just doing simply one kind of ideological work and everywhere speaks sort of in the same voice. Now I am, sort of Daniel's question about the name of the father is sort of haunting that statement because I do wonder if um, everywhere that the family speaks, it speaks in the name of the father. And I think that, that Althusser might, might in fact believe that, but um, that is not to say that it always speaks in the same way and says the same thing. And, um, and so I think this is especially important for thinking about um, the ideological representation and role of uh, white familialism um, and how that sort of figures very differently than the representation and role of the black family in sort of feeding ideologies of supremacy and dominance. Certainly what I wouldn't want to suggest is that there there is some simple story that you could tell about the family as such that couldn't sort of account for these differences. And yet one of the things I think is quite interesting about Althusser's theory of ideology is that he is asking us to essentially seat the family in whatever way it speaks in the context of the imperatives of the state. And, and so, Congru like congruously with the state, um, but I think it always, uh, for Althusser speaks sort of in reference uh, to its imperatives.
So it's sort of a, a vague answer. I mean, I, I also think that there's a way that in our sort of contemporary moment, we have to be thinking the family and um, we, we sort of know this from the pandemic, right? The sort of the intensification and escalation of family violence in the context of, of the pandemic, um, the uh, further isolation and secrecy in which this uh, violence is shrouded while paradoxically cameras are coming into our private lives. And it seems to me that also some aspect of Althusser's theory of the state that might be um, kind of updated or repurposed or refined from the perspective of the present is to think more carefully about the relationship between uh, the state as a repressive uh, power and the state as an ideological power. It seems to me that the family, I mean, of course, I don't think Althusser, uh, I, I think this is, this is a, uh, an analytical <laughs> distinction that sort of helps Althusser make the kinds of arguments that he wants to make, that he also admits um, is, is, a, is, is a difficult distinction to draw and a strained distinction, but I think that the family is an interesting place to think through the absolute collapse of that distinction altogether. Um, and uh, and so the other way that I might want to think with and beyond Althusser is to sort of think about the repressive powers of of the state as um, at the always um, I, I don't know in the last analysis or in the first analysis everywhere uh, in uh, the analysis of ideology. Okay, um, thank you, thank you both. Um, so. We're at 515. Um, I think we have, if, if we have Raphael and Duncan on the queue, if you're willing to like kind of do one more round of questions, um, I don't want anybody to feel like their question's been like left out or, um, or anything. Uh, we also have this substantial question from Hugo that I sent you. Why don't I address this quickly? Uh, so this is this question, this is very interesting, a text that I am not familiar with by Jean-Claude Miner uh, called The Material of Forgetting. And can you send me this, whoever, the uh, Hugo? Hugo, yeah. So I think maybe that's a conversation that, we, that you should <laughs> have by email um, or something like that. Uh, so why don't we go ahead with, um, Raphael. Uh, Robin and Assad, thank you very much for, for these really interesting presentations and for uh, taking the time to answer all of these questions. Um, I'll try to be brief, but I just have kind of short questions for both of you. Um, Robin, um, thinking about what you said about the, the idea that both the family and the state are both eternal or present themselves as eternal, but also have a certain historicity, or at least that they're not without history. I'm trying to think of the way that, um, why it was that the bourgeois state in its kind of ideal form, let's say of the 19th century, actually presented itself as a historical state, or at least it was linked to a kind of historicity in terms of the, the um, evolution of this kind of political institution over time um, through the contrast of, let's say, so-called primitive versus so-called advanced societies. So there was a kind of teleology that was there. And um, what, uh, whether this kind of historicist and evolutionistic conception of the political, um, why that, that became a necessary or perhaps a contingent but still necessary way of presenting the eternality of the state through this kind of um, process oriented way of looking at it. Um, and, and whether um, Althusser has uh, provides us with some of the tools for basically thinking through this, this contradiction or this paradox. Um, and for Assad, um, my question had to do with um, just something you mentioned very briefly about the presence of the description of ideology as cement um, that I think you mentioned um, as um, exists in, in one of Althusser's texts. I wasn't sure if it was contradiction and or determination or perhaps somewhere else. But um, it reminded me that this metaphor of ideology as cement um, is also found in Gramsci, uh, 
Uh, and uh, I don't know if it's if it's found earlier than Gramsci, but it, but it is there in the prison notebooks, um, uh, where Gramsci writes that ideology is um, the role of ideology is to cement and unify unify the existence of a particular social block in a kind of organic manner. Um, and I was wondering if um, what the presence of this in Althusser both says about his relationship to Gramsci, but also whether that idea of um, of the cementing of a social block or a power block, rather than a, uh, let's say something like a simplistic pres uh, presentation of uh, like, let's say the proletariat class or the ruling class. Um, it actually points us towards a more, um, a, a less, let's say economistic understanding of the way that social formations and classes operate and, and whether that might actually be a constructive step towards what you're talking about in the terms of creating a new hegemonic or counter hegemonic force um, in, in the way that um, uh, uh, wh what you, when, you, when you say the invention of new forms, whether that might help us think through that. Alex, do we want to take a couple more questions or do you want us to? Um, yeah, why don't, um, Duncan, why don't you ask your question and then um, we'll go to a break. Oh, great. So my question is the last question, um, which is good because my question is very simple. Uh, and it's just, what is Marxism? More precisely, um, to be less facetious, um, it's for Assad. And it's given this kind of this idea of the old language of class struggle or the, um, the insufficiency of the term class, you answered another question by talking about how during the Cultural Revolution, class no longer captures the political antagonisms, there must be uh, a question of what exactly uh, Marxism means or might mean, particularly for Althusser in general, because never mind the people who will say something like, without the party, we are nothing. I'm sure many more would say, without class, there's no Marxism. So what's Marxism going to be under this picture? Um, what's that term going to mean is the question I have for Assad. Um, let me just respond quickly to Raphael. It's a great, um, it's a great question. It's a wonderful question. Um, and this question about the emergence of a kind of historical understanding of the state or the state's historical understanding of itself and, and in terms of a kind of progressive realization of the tasks of civilization or something like that. And you could say actually that first I would say that there is a certain corollary in the discourse or the ideology of the family and that's the sort of emergence of the family as a sentimental institution, right? So like, which I think is, it, it would be interesting to sort of think about the relationship between these two, between the state's um, at least superficially historical sense of itself and the family is historical, right? The sort of emerging historical sense within the family. In terms of the resources for thinking without this hair about this though, I mean, it does strike me um, that that historical sense, you know, the state sort of sense of itself as a historical machinery um, is you might say premised on a belief in something that was in fact in eternal, right? So like the sort of kernel of reason in history or uh, the kind of seed of freedom in uh, human history or something along those lines. And I think that there, one of the resources in thinking with Althusser would be Althusser's sort of critique of a kind of Hegelian dialectic, both. I mean, you might say this sort of critique runs in sort of two ways. I mean, it's simultaneously kind of can't see real history, <laughs> the sort of simple and flat uniformity of the Hegelian dialectic can't see uh, sort of the kind of, you could say like real dynamism of history, but also can't see uh, sort of that uh, which, um, is uh, sort of und undetermined uh, historically or um, 
uh, invented. Um, so, 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 so both the sort of the, the, the inability in Hegel to see um, the sort of the, the past as it, as it actually uh, was and, uh, and the future or, or, the, or a possible uh, sort of alternative future. So that might be kind of one way to think about, I mean, I think that it would be a sort of um, a very superficial historical sense because even that historical sense is premised on something which um, is itself eternal and, uh, and made to manifest in history. And so, um, and, and so I think one of the things that I would want to ask is, um, is like sort of how, how, his, how historical is that historical sense in fact? Um, and, and how is history sort of being uh, sort of deployed here on behalf of a project that is actually uh, sort of understood as eternal? So <clears throat> there are three major uses by Althusser of the um, uh, language of cement. And um, the one I was referring to is in the, in the text on the Cult for Revolution, 1967. Many of the uh, arguments and moves that he makes in this text anticipate the text on uh, ideology and ideological state apparatuses. There's, there's uh, a very striking anticipation. Uh, however, he doesn't use the language of cement in the, in the ISA's essay. He uses this architectural language in a very interesting way and says that, you know, the, the base and superstructure by establishing levels is uh, a rejection of the Hegelian totality. Um, that's an interesting reframing of it, uh, but he doesn't use the cement thing. In reading Capital in a footnote, he uh, cites Croce, and then he cites Gramsci, what you cited, and then he says, you can see how Hegelian this is, and this is in the uh, critique of Gramsci. Then in, in Marx, in, in his limits, 78, uh, he repeats this criticism um, much more uh, strongly, uh, that this, this is a, the, the language of cement is a Hegelian uh, uh, residue in Gramsci. So this is uh, complicated. I think that um, in, the, in the Cultural Revolution essay, he appears to be experimenting with this language and he doesn't, see, you know, after already rejecting it, he doesn't seem to find it satisfactory. Uh, and he uses it a little bit differently from what you pointed out Gramsci does. And he's not talking about um, uh, the formation of a social block. He's using the language of cement to imply that there's something liquid which can go everywhere and then solidify. Uh, so it enters into all of our, uh, all of the nooks and crannies of our everyday life. Uh, and so it's, it's a very different usage. I mean, what, the, the, what you are talking about is interesting, but in fact, it leads us to the other question, which is, uh, and this is also, um, actually what the, uh, the Hugo's question that was transmitted to me uh, is also about in a strong sense, which is about what, what am I saying uh, if I think we should forget class struggle? I'm not really saying that though, I, I've, so it's a, a provocation of a kind. Um, I think that uh, the, the, what I'm drawing out and you know, I, it would be interesting to think about this in light of the, this morning's uh, panel that there is a sense in which uh, class struggle has to be subordinated to communism uh, as a political prescription, we can say. Uh, and that um, without that uh, class struggle, I mean, you know, it, we can go through all of the uh, moments in the history of Marxism where the centrality of class struggle is put in suspension. So there's Marx's letter to Vedemeyer. He says, look, I didn't come up with class struggle. All the bourgeois historians and economists knew about it. I pointed out 
that it's going to lead to the dictatorship of the proletariat and then to a classless society. You have Lenin, you know, the, the idea that spontaneous class struggle does not lead to the uh, change of political power and that that is an, a condition that is prescribed by the party. Uh, and so I think th this is not so much a departure from Marxism, but it is a little bit <laughs> in the sense that uh, we've now put into question the correspondence between the political prescription and the sociological categories. And this is the, this is the great question of Marxism. What is the correspondence? Uh, how do you understand? Do you understand it in terms of uh, philosophy of history? Uh, do you understand it in terms of, uh, should, should we re reframe it in terms of some kind of uh, uh, rational choice uh, kind of concept? We see, we see all of these. But I think that there's something about the, um, th there is a, an, an independent political moment uh, which is not reducible to um, the determination of social groups and so on. And so that's kind of uh, my argument. Uh, and this uh, question uh, about forgetting was, you know, uh, uh, why, wh what is it that we should forget and why do we choose particular things to forget? Um, and uh, it, 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 made me think of, you know, the 1954 seminar of Lacan, in which he says, look, you have to understand there's a dialectic of forgetting. Because obviously, you know, I mean, the, in, in classical psychoanalysis, you're, there, there is forgetting is, is, is something that has to be overcome through working through, there's, there has to be a remembering and a working through. Uh, and then Lacan says here, there's a dialectic of forgetting because to enter, he says to enter into history, you have to forget uh, a lot of things which uh, don't make it into the symbolic order. And uh, so this forgetting is necessary. Uh, and is, a successful analysis will involve this forgetting. And then Jean Nicolet is in the audience and he says, but how can you call this uh, uh, successful? And what about the forgetting of forgetting? And then they have this argument about Heidegger and the forgetting. <laughs> but you know, this is this is uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, to, to what extent uh, every you know we we uh, the, a, a subjectivity is constituted by a certain minimal level of forgetting, and uh, so does it mean that we forget the class struggle? I don't know, but it 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 means that uh, there is something about. Uh, the 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 what Lacan says the the what the dark shadows that didn't make it into the symbolic that uh, have to be forgotten for us to become subjects and there's something of that in in uh, the history of Marxism I think. Well, with that, um, thank you. Uh, let's all um, thank Assad and Robin one more time for their wonderful papers and. Um, thank you to all for your questions and um, which, yeah, and this very wide ranging and, and exciting discussion. Um, we will be returning at 7.30 Eastern time uh, for our last, uh, for our evening panel uh, with, with Warren Montag, Nathan Brown and Adrian Johnson. Um, and I look forward to seeing many of you there again. Um, thank you all so much. Um, this has been a, a, a pleasure.